Hello everyone, today we talk about late medieval Aegean roads. Uh, we discussed medieval Greece and in the same period from a political point of view to the day we give a bit of an economical vest to it. And reflecting chiefly and, and naturally mostly on the Italian trade uh, that was monopolizing the uh, the routes, the mostly the, the exports, the imports uh, in the area and connecting this, the, all the, the lands fundamentally that faced the sea. So the great areas of, of Latin trade um, in, in the Aegean and in the Balkans proper fell into three distinct zones. One was Peloponnese, the Moray. Right, was a principality on its own. Then the Venetian insular domain and the Genoese possessions. Mm -hmm. The latter two being fundamentally of um, of coastal nature. As you know, these maritime republics were not interested in having a properly a, a land mass to, to go on. They had left it uh, after the Fourth Crusade to to feudal powers and essentially dealt with mostly with, with um, coastal um, centers and uh, properly quarters in even cities ruled by other powers. Um, naturally, there are certain islands that were occupied altogether, if you think about Negroponte or, or Crete, um, etc. And as we will see, there were also important in interland junctures, let's say, but they were operated for, for, for the minimum, right, for uh, ruling having to deal the least possible with the nuisance of controlling um, a territorial surface. So the Peloponnese was, um, albeit not under the Venetian control, properly um, a great asset for the same republic, because in here the Venetians had obtained total freedom of trade since the creation of the Frankish Principality. Mm -hmm. The Venetians had properly given up their due land uh, in, in, uh, after 1204 for, for these uh, prerogatives, privileges. And at the end of the 13th century, from the first known Venetian deliberations um, uh, in, in, the, in the Republic's assemblies, we know that the trade uh, of, of Venice relied uh, enormously on the junction specifically between Clarence and Apulia. So Clarence is basically located in the northwestern corner of the Peloponnese. So you have from the other side a bunch of islands, then Apulia, the Ottoman Strait, and that's what, as you know, as a, as a strategic asset was fundamental for Venetian trade because it properly connected uh, was a channel of sea that connected the Republic to to Greece, right, to to the Aegean. So Clarence was naturally very convenient. Um, for the routes between Italy and and the same principality of Morea that you know benefited from, from the same Italian trade revived the the local economy in the first place, and, and this is especially um, after the mm, the principality had passed under the Angevin domain. Um, the Venetian the, the local Venetian consuls was fundamentally in charge controlling uh, that trade would operate smoothly, right? Sometimes the principality disturbed uh, the, you know, the, the same trade because, you know, political nuisances always here. We, we skip naturally all the, the, the dramatic complications and the instability of, of medieval world, etc. So there is never such a thing like, you know, that's the ally point. No, that there are always problems and strains, but altogether things will work fundamentally fine. Um, and in general here, we, as we will see, there is a general mm, uh, decline right, tro of the properly uh, of control from the sign, especially this land mm, mass powers uh, in during the, the last uh, two centuries of the Middle Ages, of which um, properly, yeah, the, the trade activities benefited because they were ever less controlled. This brought also to the rise of piracy, right? That's the moment in which Venice basically passed to the you know to to the necessity of further consolidating certain positions in the area to, to preserve um, the trade. Um, the Venetians brought to Clarence 
metals and cloth while importing salt, cereals, cotton, oil, raw silk and raisins. And um, so the move there, so this, this essentially novel um, trade expeditional system were, that were, was very regulated and fundamentally were, were large, you know, yeah, uh, ship mm, uh, expeditions, uh, mostly with cargoes loaded and protected by the, the mm, yeah, properly wore galleys that had very specific schedule and that the Republic controlled. Well, these motives were authorized to make stopping clearance um, and unarmed ships to collect merchandise left in transit by the galleys. It's also interesting to realize that in spite of the conflictuality between the Italian maritime republics, different um, city communities were to be found in these same trade centers. For example, the Genoese, notoriously the most ferocious uh, adversaries of Venice, also did business in, in Clarence. Right? These, uh, here we have to understand properly how private sometimes this initiative was. The, the, the same republics, uh, I mean, Venice was m most uh, regulated, most advanced administrative political control, properly had a greater grip, a bit of more of a liturgistic policy on, on this trade dynamics. But also, you know, it, it was, the whole thing was moved by, largely by private initiative of the great Venetian uh, families, right? The same thing was in Genoa, albeit less regulated, the, their private element prevailed, but let's say, you know, all the, the merchants that uh, sail the Mediterranean, of course, these people came f but from everywhere, right? They were s same as we will see with the Justiniani, for example, they, they actually administered Kias on behalf of the Genoese, they were Venetians. So in Clarence you could find Genoese, we know that they invested something like um, 4,620 pounds uh, in 16 contracts between 1274 and uh, 1345, which is not a few. Also, the Ragusans, right, today is Dubrovnik, this important Adriatic Republic, uh, was interested in these ports, not just in Clarence, but, but uh, the rest of the principalities, from which they imported wheat, hides, silk and linen, and where they imported woven cloth, wine and cheeses. Consider here that there is all a, a broader uh, traffic that involves the, the whole Balkans and not only also the Anatolian interland, etc. If we're not talking of the, the more developed Western European you know, production system, as we will see here basically through Venice, Genoa, you it was all a connection with Flanders, with England, right? So that, that's how far they went. And this is all broader in, in even a larger scale perspective of the Eurasian trade, right? And not all, mainly the Silk Road and not only, but even on a smaller scale, I don't know, the Ragusans, for example, accessed the Balkan, the Balkan hinterland, right? The Venetians, the specialized textile industries, and, um, you know, met metallurgic production. So um, it was really, a, a bit here we're schematizing it but it was very complex and I hope at some point we will also enter in these details. Um, as we were saying before um, and as we generally know uh, the second half of the 14th century saw so, uh, a contraction in trade because of the Black Death and the uh, as cause consequence of the broader um, medieval economical demographic mm, crisis right, uh, brutal c uh, contraction, and that's where also properly local authority began to decrease because local powers were less, you know, centralized, less resourceful, and this brought to a general decline. Think, think about the Angevins, even in the same, not just in Morea, but in the same Naples, they, are, they, they had big issues, uh, that's where especially these smaller powers, to, you know, flourished because they could always interfere and in insert themselves from the top chiefly of their naval power that was the only one that, that maritime republics uh, uh, you know that, that er anybody had right in terms of properly a, essentially a de facto permanent fleet right because the state of these republics might have not actually maintained many at once but uh, many ships at once but ships were always there they could simply uh, hire them in time of war 
but all these straight vessels can be transformed into war and they were always armed actually so no no other power right no other kingdom etc had this naval capacity we've seen it recently we made a video on the uh venetian navy uh organization in the 14th 15th century military wise well yeah there is a growth of centralization of properly state maintained uh, galleys, but most of what the state actually did was building galleys in this dramatically advanced, most powerful arsenal of the time, and sub essentially subcontracting them to, to the privates that managed the, this business. Um, so, as a consequence, Clarence um, declined as well, um, together with the broader uh, pr principality situation. Around 1435, the Spanish merchant Pedro Tafur noted this stagnation uh, locally uh, during one of his journey. Patras was uh, um, the, the, mo the, you know, he said the rising center in this. Patras is, as you know, is basically at the mouth of the current Gulf, a little bit north east than, than Clarence. Um, so this center had become more important. Um, we know that in 1400 the Venetian Senate estimated the value of merchandise brought by their nationals at uh, 80,000 ducats, right? Whereas the the latter year was 60,000 to uh, 70,000. So it's an important decline overall that invested the area um, and. Patras was fundamentally entrusted properly to Venetian protection. The uh, the local archbishop in 1408 conferred control of the city to Venice because this is what happens, right? These local powers are becoming too weak, so cities have interest to remain protected, defended, and to uh, and well inserted into a commercial circuit. So they hand over their suzerainty to Venice, and you know, wasn't. Uh, altogether facing much of a crisis compared to other powers and definitely for locally in Greece. Um, so um, the Venetians kind of compensated for the decline of Clarence with the acquisition of Patras. Uh, in the region the Venetians also played an important role uh, properly in the, in the interland up to the, 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 the beginning of the 15th century. They exported in here uh, raw materials and manufactured goods while uh, taking uh, wheat, cotton, honey and raw silk. Mm -hmm. Eventually things came to, to an end um, when the despot Constantine Palaiogos in 1428 recaptured both Clarence and Patras to Byzantine rule and this uh, essentially uh, cut the, the at least the, the, the most intense relations with, with Venice that naturally was still around, but now dealing with a renewed power in the interland. Um, and we also don't know exactly, in all this, what other powers, such as, I don't know, the Catalan duchies uh, were doing in this broader Mediterranean picture, how they interplay. Um, that's how few were documented uh, at some point. Then, for, uh, for Venice, other two major important centers were Coron and Modon in the south of the Peloponnese in Messenia. Um, the Venetians defined uh, in, in, in their senate these two towns as the oculi capitales, so the heads eyes uh, of, of the same Venice. Um, they were the first strategic importance because basically they controlled as the southernmost end of, of, of mainland Greece. Uh, the um, the movement of enemy uh, fleets, right? They also served as an important logistical base for the uh, reconquest of rebel Crete in the years 1363-1364. So they had they were important staging posts for for trade uh, for trade vessels. Uh, they were important warehouses. Uh, they there was a lot of traffic in here. Right, it was the bit the obliged point of passage. And that's why they were so important. And from the archives of the Datini uh, merchant family of Prato, we have a pretty good idea how much 
um, uh, and how much how, how varied, especially merchandise, could be found as in, in modern um, cotton, sugar, spices, right? Some of you know the so these are all Eastern uh, goods, right? And some of also the the most prized that the Venetians imported from here. Now, corn and modern were important also because they had a rich agricultural interland. Therefore, they contributed to the same trade circuit with their own the, the export of their own agricultural products, mainly stock r rearing. Um, and um, for for these reasons, um, the Venetians, uh, at the rise properly of Greek and Turkish piracy, in the chiefly but since the end of, of, of the 14th century, began to expand that much in, in the Mycenaean interland, basically to, to connect Koran and Modern from the same, so that there could be, you know, if, even if they had remained cut out from, from the sea, they could at least essentially communicate with each other uh, from, from the interland. Uh, these acquisitions were carried out by the Venetians between 1390 and 1430. Um, so the the insular domain of Venice was instead something that the Republic took a much more um, dirigistic and um, you know direct mm, control on, right? Um, this um, could included naturally the, the major island was Crete with uh, with other uh, islands that uh, were fundamentally interdependent on each other for reasons we'll explain in a while. So Crete, okay, it was the most important, it's kind of obvious, it was an ancient uh, area of, uh, also Byzantine emperors had, you know, developed in, um, intensive uh, agriculture properly aimed at the export. When the Venetians acquired uh, this area, they, uh, they, uh, they essentially maintained this, th this role uh, of, of the island. Uh, Crete also connected the um, the Western Mediterranean with the uh, with Asia Minor, that at this point was essentially being taken over by the Turks, that exported important goods such as slaves, wheat, horses, and alum, and that got from the same Crete textiles, wine, and soap. Important were also the uh, archipelago islands. Mm -hmm that uh, were out just between basically Crete uh, and, and mainland Greece, uh, a bit like to, to, towards the east, but um, being this important uh, connection also for the, the same territories um, from a strategic point of view, that however were, you know, historically uh, in chronic shortage of cereals because they didn't have much of, a, you know, a local, you know, plains or, you know, uh, even in extensive enough to, to, to produce. So Crete was vital for the maintenance of the same islands. Uh, so we're talking, um, you know, so cereals were exported normally also to, to Negroponte. And the same corn and modern that as we've seen were, were also capable of important farming uh, production. Um, and for Venice, uh, especially uh, the uh, even in 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 a for a larger landmass like Crete, the most important centers were the the portal ones and chiefly Candia, Heraclion, um, that played an essential role in the Mediterranean uh, trade, because through here passed essentially two convoys of galleys per year, the ones towards Cyprus, and the ones towards Syria and Alexandria. So uh, up to 1373, when the Genoese captured Famagusta, the Cypriot uh, trade was the most important uh, for, for Venice, because basically Crete received from here salt, sugar, while exporting cereals to, to the island. Uh, the Corner family had uh, important possessions in, in Crete and around Piscopi, dominated as you know, their clan did this, most of these exchanges from a private p 
point of view, and naturally in cooperation with with Venice, the, the the Republic that had the, because they shared the same interests fundamentally. There were episodes of rebellions, also feudal um, Venetian feudal lords in Crete, but you know uh, those were generally still um, framed to mostly because of the exploitation of the same island resources, not because of the properly of the trade dynamics per se. Um, the galleys of Syria and Alexandria brought spices, silk, and cotton, right? And uh, this made the Cretan warehouses some of the most important in the whole Mediterranean trade, right? That's properly the Silk Road uh, branch uh, passing through the Mediterranean. Um, also, Crete itself produced, as we have seen, a um, great deal of agricultural resources. It was basically Venice's granary for wheat, uh, for which the, the state had a, a properly a monopoly on, uh, and the great landowners could not export um, wheat if not with the authorization of, of the Senate's Republic specifically. Um, also, wine from Malvasia, uh, the set grapes, cotton, wood, cheeses, and hides uh, were imported uh, to, to Venice. Right, uh, the city dominated the Cretan economy. Right, and, and this demands brought to frequent revolts, even among the ranks of Venetian feudatories, more largely being the, the local Cretan populations. But they were always put down. Uh, and that tells you also the, the intense regime of exploitation that it had. Um, then the island of Negroponte. Um, that this was shared essentially between Venice and the three Latin lords um, of, 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 uh, of the place. And it was an obliged point of passage for the Muda of Romani, the one that traded with Constantinople. And the galleys of this route usually stopped either at the end of August um, or um, when they were coming from Venice or on the return uh, in November from Constantinople. Um, so this was properly a strategic um, center because you know that the um, you know there was no way basically to properly intercept, like to to close, let's say, to stop trade routes this time in history, right? So. Um, you could blockade certain passage uh, choke points, etc. But sh ships would usually pass. But there were specific, um, in fact, choke points that combined with broader political, you know, dynamics and the I don't know the winds that that existed, the currents to, throughout the year that could increase the possibility of properly intercepting. The, the enemy cargoes. So that's where basically Venice and, and Genoa usually, you know, killed each other, spending an astonishing amount of, of this wealth that, however, still repaid them because, you know, this trade was, was far enough and you don't do it if you are essentially losing. Um, and um, this, this uh, Negroponte route was, uh, was probably very important for the same uh, Byzantine economy, right? It, because they uh, they got from here um you know woolen and linen cloth etc but the island of negroponte pro properly stored in here also the products of greece proper like we're talking about wood hides valania used for dyeing uh wax cotton cereals resins um etc all this stuff was brought to the west um calcis was the island's principal port uh historically uh, and it was located in the axis um, f uh, between Macedonia and Crete that was mostly trading in wood and cereals, hides, clothes, things like that. And um, however, at this point, the I mean, private initiative um, took, took over. Like even the same re Republican government couldn't control everything proper. So in here, um, there were lots of private commissions mostly dealing with uh, the Thessalian coast in spring and autumn right and um, inflating the you know the, the broader traffics and still you know uh, depending on 
uh, the allegiance of, of these families, you know, so increasing the their their city their city's income. Thessalonica was the um, a big the, the a bit main center of, of of the area. You know, it basically was the the only true city in the Byzantine Empire after Constantinople proper. Even provided with some some entrepreneurial initiative, unlike other Byzantine uh, cities that made it slightly more similar to the Italian maritime republics than to a Byzantine uh, center. They tried to autonomize themselves from Constantinople, in short, also through these straits. Uh, the Venetians had a consul in Thessalonica. Uh, they had this actually small merchant colony, uh, which mm, had the task to gather wheat from uh, Macedonian the Bulgarian plains and distributing woolen and linen cloth uh, in locally from the west. Uh, and the Venetian presence in Thessalonica continued even after the Ottoman occupation of the city. You know that there was a, a, there were important sieges in here. The Venetians probably also underestimated Ottoman capability at that point, but even after the fall, they both the, the Venetians and the Turks needed to, to trade that that was one of the best spots. Um, in Thessalonica there were also Ragusan merchants active at least since 1234 uh, and we know this because the uh, despot Manuel Comneno Ducas had granted them a trade privilege in there. There, are, uh, there were also Genoese in here. They, they had a consul there in 1305 um, and um, between the end of the 13th and beginning of the 14th century Thessalonica was the target of several Genoese trade investments. Um, albeit um, this, uh, these were mm, basically um, uninged, were autonomous from the broader Genoese um, uh, you know, eastern um, Aegean coast trade. It was the most important for the Ligurian city, right? And that was properly the heart of uh, the Genoese uh, Aegean possessions uh, fr uh, from the end of the 13th century onwards. You know that basically the Genoese were settled there by the uh, Palaiologoi in, in an anti Venetian function because Venice fr was from the side of the Latin Empire and whereas the Genoese were helping against Venice naturally the uh, the, the Palo Yologo recovering their European possessions. Um, under the Genoese rule of the Zaccaria family, it lasted um, between 1304 and uh, 1329, uh, the island of Chios uh, witnessed a, a, a very important economical development chiefly connected, famously enough, with the trade of mastic and alum, right? Especially the latter, quite a great importance after 1346. Uh, and when the um, the Genoese Maona secured its control, the Maona in, in, um, for, for the Genoese was sort of, uh, yeah, it was a trade company, right? Um, and alum... Why was it so important? Well, because it, it was um, indispensable for fixing dye in cloth, right? And it mostly came from the mines of Fosea on the coast of Asia Minor. Albeit the Justiniani Venetian family worked, however, for the Genoese later, tried to control properly the production of alum from um, important um, continental sources, properly at that point in Ottoman territory. Um, so we're talking about places like Colonia, that is either Sharkir, Shabin, Kar um, Hisar, uh, Kutaya, Ulubad, and uh, also Kizikos. So an area that could reach, mm, at least, you know, it was still ar along the coast, but properly also delving deep into Turkish territory. Um, so Kios was also properly the place where Alum was stored. Right, and where ships and cogs transported this to up to Flanders, for example, for the textile industry. That the you know the Genoese had basically opened the Atlantic route because the the Venetians had ousted them largely from 
from the Eastern Mediterranean. So they, they mostly had these centers here, and but they had, however, to 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 bring these goods back to to to, to Italy, to, to the Western Mediterranean, past the Gibraltar uh, Strait, and to feed the, um, the the largest textile industry there in Flanders. Um, and the um, this phenomenon, given the fact that alum is also pretty heavy um, by uh, considering the volume, um, probably boosted what uh, was, was an important factor in the past from the Latin ships in use in the 13th century to the square rigged cogs, right? And this brought Genoa to, um, you know, to actually surpass other maritime republics um, in um, as far as the the larger ship tonnage was was concerned so chiefly a technological thing uh, this helped as you know brought important changes in trade and navigation because it's also stabilized the, the ship for the mass that this allowed to even to mount artillery at some point to counter the the inertia um, you know to 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 absorb the the, the hit for thanks to the inertia the, the mass of the transported goods um, this this was all happening in a moment of uh, enormous development of these trades, right? Uh, even if the, the broader s situation internationally was contracting and having problems, these powers were developing an astonishing, um, uh, properly level of 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 accounting, of banking, of, of things that would last basically until, until the Renaissance unchanged. Right, we're dominated by these powers. Um, in 1455, however, the Genoese um, lost Fossere. And so, it, and together with that, an important part of the exchanges between the East and the West. Right? Um, and um, this brought further to, to an increase inside of the ships. Right? Because they, they basically. Uh, wanted to to rotate to to load as much as they could in a single, uh, in 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 yeah, without exposing essentially more ships to to uh, to to uh, more diluted trade in, in time and space, right? So and also they increased the, the the rotation in the shipping by means of a direct maritime links between Kiev, Flanders, and the same England. So consider yeah, because the the Ottomans were rising, right? So uh, the situation was more difficult than it seemed. This brought to an important contraction of trade for, for some time. Also, the Venetians suffered importantly of this, but the Genoese were the ones that basically lost the most just being in front of, of Anatolia and, um, you know, witnessing eventually the, the, the same expansion of the Turks across the sea into Europe. Um, so, Kias also produced mastic, as we've seen, gum of the mastic, Mastic tree that is known as Lentiscus in scientific uh, classification. It was highly prized in the medieval world. Uh, the Giussiani family had the monopoly on it. They controlled the production, distribution, and they also mm, mm, developed uh, the business further by creating certain mm, agricultural societies. Um, that would invest their share in uh, in these great spheres of commerce, right? And all this between essentially the Byzantine Empire, Turkey, uh, and also Syria, Egypt, and, and Cyprus. And the amount of made in Kiss thus functioned as a sort of plantation economy in the modern sense of the term, right? Uh, they, they 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 got it similar to what. The Venetians did in, in Crete. Kiyos, um redistributed the products of international trade in Asia Minor via Ephesus and Palazzo, and um, they also had important warehouses in Anatolia uh, proper. This this is particularly important because Kiyos was on the axis between the uh, north and south and the east and west routes right they properly uh, connected um, the straits uh, up to as far as the Constantinople and the Black Sea um, to Syria Alexandria right through Rhodes and Famagusta right so this was properly the heart 
of the Genoese international trade. Also for the, for as far as the West was concerned, because their trade um, didn't stop locally. That This was all finalized mostly towards Western export. Um, another very important island for the Genoese was Mytilene. Uh, was ruled by the Gattilusio family. These were uh, all imperial possessions that had been subcontracted to the Genoese. And uh, they they would also take part in piracy themselves, right? What's the difference, actually, for regular trade? They were always basically armed, fighting, whatever. So um, this piracy, per se, contributed definitely to increasing the resources of the Gattilusio uh, family. Um, and uh, they... Uh, they mostly were interested also in uh, the alum of Calonis. Uh, the uh, the port of Mytilene properly uh, was a medium for Genoese trade uh, towards Egypt. I mean, between Egypt and Constantinople, uh, Rhodes and Chios, right? And it was also heavily um, involved with the uh, slave trade of Black Sea. Uh, you know, Black Sea slaves to Mamluk Egypt, right? That was so fundamental for the Mamluk army prop. And the Gattilusio Sea is the northern Aegean islands at the beginning of the 15th century, together with the port of Venus, that is the mouth of the Maritza, from which basically they could access the cereal resources of Trace and the Bulgarian plains. So entering basically properly the Balkan interland in trade in rich. Mm. So here naturally we have simplified a lot uh, a, a situation that was dramatically unstable as all basically the, the medieval ones because here were fluctuations, hindrances of any uh, important kind that you know just you know for a single policy could shift important uh, traffics, assets and so on. For example the papacy had traditionally prohibited trade with the Saracens Right, and these dispositions had been followed around, um, let's say, up to the mid 14th century, where at that point uh, there was a, f a broader contraction. Like, pr probably the international situation, even even the Muslim powers of the Mediterranean, were seen as less of a threat practically, and also um, the economical crisis needed to properly expand and more forcefully into more convenient markets in the first place. But this initial prohibition gave, um, you know. Uh, greater uh, importance to uh, Christian uh, axes, such as the one um, through Rhodes, Cyprus, and Lesser Armenia in the first half of the 14th century. Um, Crete, as we've seen, was a very important uh, Venetian um, center, and uh, Negroponte was uh, unavoidably connected to to the Constantinopolitan uh, trade, right? But this also changed a bit when, in the second half of the 14th century, the um, the Latins were accepted by the Mamluks again into the Syrian and uh, Egyptian trade posts uh, legally, at least because of course connection had always remained. The Genoese conquest of Cyprus, as we've seen, basically cut the Venetian presence in there. Um, albeit the Genoese compensated uh, because they would lose that that asset themselves in the say okay the, the island altogether was was more important right so that's what they they did of course but I don't know they compensated also importantly with Kiev that as we've seen was uh, this very central um, asset that connected also into the into the Anatolian interland right so imagine all the political connections that existed even between these powers that is to say if you make war with one another you also lose more and this is uh, what often also dictated the, the broader policy um, in general um, we see uh, as for many areas in Europe that fundamentally the mid 14th century crisis brings to an uh, important contraction of trade traffic this is witnessed by many scholars uh, it's properly the the you know there is no thing such as the high level uh, of trade of the early period, uh, the first half of the 14th century, right? This drops significantly 
uh, in the mid-century and basically doesn't recover from re recession up to the first decades of decades of the 15th so reflect on how you know structural this damage properly was it was not due to the black debt alone though uh, because this is the moment of rise of Ottoman uh, Ottoman power incursions specifically piracy right that that's how they began they didn't have a a fleet on their own but as we've seen this mm, the, the political contraction uh, the political instability followed to excuse me to the to the mid 14th century crisis brought all these um, uh, Islamic rulers to, to take literally the sea because that that's what they had uh, in mind right being their objective had always been you know opening the valleys that brought them to, to the sea to conquering the cities that faced the Aegean which the Byzantines had tried to prevent. Eventually they, they take over, but they don't have a unitary power, but they, they, they simply let pirates in the name of Jihad to, to launch the, these offensives. So this was very important because it began to contract, importantly, uh, the same um, the same trade. Right? They par as always with piracy, they actually contributed to boast it. But from the, from the Italian side of the story, the thing became more problematic. Because the, the, the Italian maritime, maritime republics had the big guns, right? They had the ships, they had the power. Um, like uh, the Venetians, together with the Mamluks, had the, the most advanced naval firepower technology in, 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 uh, in Europe, in the Mediterranean. So, um, but piracy is something more attritional. Uh, it's something more difficult to control, as we've seen. It's, uh, you know, you can't even block large expeditions sometimes you can't imagine you know and it smaller ones and um it, it's a it's a big investment which naturally brings also these islands to start defending themselves more autonomously investing more of their profit in in defense and also entrenching themselves in a way in their own possessions so the the three is in spite of the political crisis a need to to, to to invest properly more in, into the properly in the interland, right? This is in Europe, seen in Europe altogether. The great international traffic's basically contract. This is true for Eurasia altogether, right? So the land, for example, turn, comes back to be a, a more profitable investment compared to the uh, unstable financial uh, situation. So territorialization here also is a big deal, right? And at least the, the Venetians and the Genoese maintained well, before the the main Ottoman onslaught to, to control their asset because they had remained the, the only ones or together with few minor power that still lived within the stability that these these republics provided the ones that had properly the assets to to maintain such domains which is quite important of course and it surely made them earn still a lot of money in spite of all of all the crisis this is um, for sure the Venetians did complain about piracy, that this is echoed uh, in all the sources, as present also in the famous business letters of the Datini family, um, in its very rich archive, um, Prato. Um, and uh, sure is, is that, as, as always, human history, there is no crisis, no war that eventually prevents business for, for, for long. Uh, so uh, the the Venetians and the Genoese managed to cope with the uh, with the Turks with the same Greeks of Mistra, right? When you talk about piracy here, like since Saracen times, you can't even properly distinguish who's who, right? Everybody joins because they're just in for the money. So they're Muslims, they're Christians, they're everybody fundamentally. Um, and surely is though that the same moment of instability eventually came to an end because the same piracy as we've seen yes looted somewhere but reinvested somewhere else and uh, as, especially as long as these mm, pirate powers were small they were usually coastal ones so they were still talking about the same trade basically just more or less violently appropriated but still re-injected in the broader system um, also these powers as soon as they they become you know, if they manage to loot enough, they kind of gentrify, they need to secure their assets themselves, so they start taxing, they start centralizing, so they start coping with the same problems that the greater powers had as well. Uh, and also, by the 20s of the 15th century, uh, there is a broader re 
you know, a revival of trade that we'll see different agents, different protagonists, and actually an importantly changed uh, situation from an international point of view. So that's something we will see on another occasion. But for now, we we'll stop it here, uh, for which I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise give a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.